Are Halloween frights coming early with a looming government shutdown? You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. Welcome to the show, folks. It is Monday. I am Matt Kopenheffer, and right here next to me, David Hansen. You are excited for this Monday. I am excited for Monday. Monday's always a great day because I've had to go through two days, two full days without doing this show. And without seeing you, which course, is horrible. Well, thank you. Although I've had to watch you on our Fantasy Football League. I mean, look, I invited you into the Fantasy Football League as a nice gesture. It looks like you are going to stay the only undefeated team after this week. I think the only thing, the only right thing to do at this point would be to give me Jimmy Graham. Well, I need Jimmy Graham to have at least 30 yards tonight. Give me three after, points. After tonight. After, no. As a, as a fellow University of Miami alumni, he's, he's staying with me. I, I'll trade you for Maurice Jones-Drew. Larry Stone's a terrible trade. Let's we've get got, on with the show. We've got a great show today, and kicking off, we, we've got to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. It pains me to talk about it. I get a stomach ache. I get agita. But Reuters, Congress in a game of chicken as shutdown looms. We've got Congress talking about a government shutdown again. I, I don't. I, I don't. What? Say something. Say something so that I don't have to talk about this. I, I don't have anything to say. It's it's. Stupid. We talk about banks, we talk about insurance companies, we talk about mortgage REITs. None of these are going to be affected by this. If we get through the shutdown and we even get to the debt ceiling and that roils the markets a little bit, it's not going to mean anything in the next five years. And that's when we're investing. We're investing wrong. in the next five years. Wrong. Wrong, wrong. I think that's wrong. wrong. <laughs> Here's my, one of my notes here is who are these people? What are, what are they thinking? The the last time we went through this, what did it end up showing? It ended up showing that we have a bunch of jokers in Congress who are more concerned about their uh, politics than about running the country and keeping the finances in order. And we ended up getting the, 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 the debt rating downgraded. Mm -hmm. And granted, last time around, I think the, the markets had the last laugh because the, the debt got downgraded and then treasuries ended up rallying. Right. So potentially we could see that again. But look, we don't want to play with that. We don't want to show... We don't want to show lenders. We don't want to show other countries. We don't want to show the rating agencies that we as a country are going to mess around with our ability and, and, uh, to repay our debts. Mm -hmm. we, just, we shouldn't be doing that. So it's time, for, it's time for Congress just to get together, be a little creative, be a little cooperative, and get something done here instead of just squabbling. Oh, God. Ajita, let's move on to the second headline. All right, headline. second headline. Going to a government that they do some creative things, too. <laughs> All right, uh, we got China... <laughs> Inaugurates Shanghai Zone in Financial Reform Drive. Now, this is interesting. So we're talking about mainland China. We're not talking about Hong Kong. We're not talking about any of those other kind of side... Special economic Special zones. ones. Uh, so this is actually China here. And the one American bank that has been granted entrance into this free zone, if you will, I think it said it was like 11 square miles of a free zone of... Uh, financial freedom. Party time. It, Eleven, it was, Eleven miles square area of just parties. It was it was Citigroup. Probably not a big surprise when we look at Citigroup. By far of the biggest banks, they have the most international exposure. I think around fifty seven percent, almost sixty percent of their revenue is coming from international markets. So I see this as kind of a, eh, okay. It, it makes me a little bit nervous. I I, I don't feel one hundred percent comfortable investing with the the Chinese financial system. You were saying before, you like this move. You think this is great I do, meh, what do you, I, I don't even understand what's going through your head when you say that. Look, one of the things that you have to get on board with to, to like this deal, and I, I understand your concern that, that China as a country, the real estate market, the financial markets, that there's a little bit to be concerned with, or maybe a lot to be concerned with. But what you've got, what you'd have to get on board with is the idea that Michael Corbett at the head of Citigroup is instilling a discipline, a credit underwriting discipline that's going to permeate throughout the bank. And that would include their Asian operations, that would include their China operations. But what I'm really excited about here is, look, we've got this special economic zone, particularly to, to, to improve financial company access in China. Mm -hmm. There are 10 banks in there. Eight of them are Chinese. One of them is from Singapore. The other one, Citigroup. I think this is huge. I think this is a big deal for Citigroup, and I think this is a reason for Citigroup investors to be excited. And I think it's a reason for investors who are not invested in Citigroup, which, by the way, is a particularly cheap big bank, mm -hmm. to be taking a look at this bank. Fair enough. Well, yes, you're, you're <laughs> right. It's fair enough. None of that mess stuff. Number three headline. This one's from the FT. Safe and boring controls are back 
after city scandals. David, we're, we're five years out of the financial crisis, and now we're talking about safe and boring controls. What is the, what is the story? How, why, why are we still talking about this five years on? Well, because the, the problems keep cropping up even today. In the article, they mentioned JP Morgan. They are spending about a billion dollars on new compliance, hiring, I think, a thousand people to get their controls in order. It's some like whale thing, some, like some aquatic. And, and you're seeing this across all of the big banks. You see it at Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and Citigroup. They're all beefing up their compliance. And when I think about these, compliance, control issues of the banks, I think it's very cyclical. And we're at the point in the cycle where there's gonna be a lot of stress on these parts of the bank. People are gonna be watching this. And over the course of the, over the, course of the lifetime at the bank, we're gonna go through times where controls get a little lax and then we're gonna tighten them again, controls a little lax. So I see this as just part of the cycle and maybe in five years they get a little lax and we get into some trouble again. So I think it's just business as usual. It, it, it is and that's, that's kind of sad to me mm -hmm. and, and when I, when I think about these these big banks, maybe that is just an ongoing problem. That doesn't necessarily impact my thesis on the investability of a few of them going forward over the next couple of years, or the next few years. But I don't, as an investor, I would rather have companies that I can trust over the long period of time and don't have to think about, mm -hmm. oh, well, is this a period where controls are lax? and they're setting themselves up for, for lawsuits and losses, or is this a period where they're tightened up and they'll, they'll be good going mm -hmm. forward? And, and maybe that's just, maybe that's something that I have to come to terms with with some of these bigger banks. My favorite boring bank, who I don't think goes through these kind of ups and downs of, of, of laxity, U.S. Bancorp. Not that their hands are perfectly clean, mm -hmm. but I think that they are in a much different, situ much different position than a lot of these other bigger banks, and I think that's a cultural thing, a, a culture throughout the bank. And I think you've got some of that going on at Wells Fargo too. Fair enough. All right, moving on to our next round, looking at a couple more headlines. I'm gonna do it rapid fire rapid style, fire though. Style. Get through them quick. Super fast. First one was from American Banker, bank M&A clouded by higher deal prices and DC gridlock. So talking about bank M&A, not investment banks advising on M&A, but actual banks merging. And the part of the headline that stuck out to me was the higher deal prices. And when we think about, okay, what are buyers paying for the banks that they're acquire, acquiring? And that average has moved up to around 1.5 times tangible book. And I looked at the 11 banks uh, that are between, that are really the core regional banks that are between like 180 billion and 36 billion. So it's a pretty wide range. And there's only 11 in there. Some of them are Huntington Bank shares, uh, Regions, uh, First Niagara. And the average of those 11 books is right around 1.5. So not well below the average. Maybe we'll start to see maybe some, some mergers in this regional activity or in this regional um, part of the banking system. I'm not banking on it. Maybe in the next couple years. I don't think You're we're going to see anything. banking on it. Okay. Maybe in the, not in the next six months. I, I, maybe something will happen. But I think over the next couple years, as maybe loan growth picks up, we may see some mergers in that area of the banking system. Over at the Wall Street Journal, the headline is Twitter expected to file public IPO papers as soon as this week. Until now, the, the paperwork for Twitter's IPO has been a big secret. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I'm gonna be watching at Twitter going forward is whether we can recapture that excitement of the Facebook IPO. I mean, that was, that was I, it was more hoopla than was needed and it ended up being fairly disastrous for early investors in, in Facebook. So I don't wish that on anybody. But in terms of the IPO business in general, which isn't a core profit driver for, for the bigger banks, you know, when, when we look at a Bank of America, they have a, a good IPO business, particularly after acquiring Merrill Lynch, but it's not a big profit driver, but still, it's a contributor. So, so if, if Twitter has that same kind of excitement level, that could be interesting for the IPO market in general. Mm -hmm. All right, next headline was from the FT. CLO issuance hits highest level since before financial crisis. CLOs, collateralized loan obligations. Sounds that, delicious. That sounds scary, maybe. But I think this is, we talked about cycles in terms of compliance and governance. I think CLOs came up through, uh, leading up to the crisis, and obviously issuance fell to basically zero after the crisis. There was no appetite for these things. I think we'll eventually get back to a, a healthy level of CLO issuance, and this will benefit the banks like Citigroup, JP Morgan. JP Morgan actually holds a fair amount on their books, around 8% of their securities portfolio is in CLOs. So I think these are, there's nothing inherently bad about these products. There were some that were mishandled leading up to the crisis, but I think we'll slowly get back to a level where they're issued. Final headline here from DealBook, 
active net worth in $1.05 billion buyout. I don't really care about active net worth, to be honest. <laughs> They're being bought out by Vista Equity Partners. Citigroup is advising active, B of A advising Vista. The reason this jumped out at me is last week, we were looking towards the close of the third quarter mm -hmm. in terms of league, league table activity for investment banks. I said that there would be a flurry of M&A activity today to try to add to those tallies. I was wrong. Fair enough. Moving on to our in focus for today, we're going to be looking at the week ahead. Mm -hmm. And so let's run down a few of the, the big things to be, to be looking out for. Of course, number one is the looming shutdown. We talked about that earlier. I don't have the Very stomach. Very important. I don't have the stomach to talk about that anymore. Do you have anything else to add to that? No, stupid. <laughs> Uh, num number two, uh, today, uh, September 30th, is the close of the third quarter. Third quarter coming to an we end. We made it. We, <laughs> we made it. We made it through another quarter. Good, good job. I, I never thought we'd do it. All right. Uh, the first of the big banks to report, the big banks will, will lead off the reporting, at least mm -hmm. in terms of the financial sector. Wells Fargo, according to Yahoo Finance, at least scheduled to report a week from today, mm -hmm. uh, October 7th. I think that sounds right. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to look at something a little bit before that. I'm going to be looking at something tomorrow. It's a very big day for some mortgage REITs. And uh, three of them that I'll be watching are presenting at a, a JMP conference. It's a real estate focused conference and some M REITs are coming in. Uh, we have Hatteras Financial, Invesco Mortgage, and Two Harbors, one of your favorites. And that this is, is one of my it's an interesting, interesting mix mm -hmm. of the mortgage REITs. Hatteras had one of the worst second quarters last quarter, uh, book value is down over 20%. And the reason was, this is a mortgage REIT that invests in adjustable rate mortgage-backed securities. And when rates went up, you might think, well, if they're adjustable rate, shouldn't they benefit from rates going up since it adjusts with the rate? Right. But over 50% of their portfolio was in adjustable rate mortgage-backed securities that don't reset for at least five years. Oh, wow. So that's not, that's not too fun right there. So you saw they had some problems with their hedges, also some problems with that. Very bad quarter from them. It'll be interesting to see what does their management see in this, in this past quarter and going forward. The other two, Invesco Mortgage Capital, more focused on the fixed rate as opposed to the adjustable rate, also did not have a very good quarter, second quarter. And Two Harbors is interesting because- Because they're awesome. Because, because yeah, the company relatively, awesome. have performed relatively well. The stocks held up relatively well this year compared to the other REITs. I know you're a fan of, of their management and, and their ability to jump around and find, okay, where is the attractive value? And that's, that's all there is at the mortgage REITs. It's, exactly. it's the management. So, so, so they can jump between agency mortgage-backed securities, non-agencies, Fit or arms and fixed. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see, okay, what does Hatteras say? What does Invesco say? They focus on arms, fixed, and then what does Two Harbors say? And they really run the gamut in terms of where they see opportunity. Well, in terms of where Two Harbors has seen opportunity, they go off into all sorts of right. di different directions. And one of those directions for a while was buying up single family homes into this big portfolio of silver fam uh, single family homes. Mm -hmm. Silver family homes, I'm getting <laughs> ahead of myself. They spun that off in a separate company, Silver Bay, and Silver Bay will also be at that JMP uh, conference. We mm -hmm. were talking about these single family home REITs recently and, and the potential or the, the danger in, in the sector going forward, if, if you can call it a sector yet. But that's another one that I'm gonna be tuning into to see what they have to say about the future and about all the all the changes that are going on, including the changes in the industry. And, and when we talk about these these conferences, some people might wonder: Does any do you really get anything out of these conferences? To some extent, it's not like they're divulging any any new information. A lot of it's already been filed, or, or they've already said it publicly. But you can still listen to the comments, still listen to management. Just what are their comments on risk? What are their comments going forward for the company? So we'll be watching that. If, if you can tune in, if you can read the transcripts, I, I think that's a great thing. And I think it's just, I think it's telling about a company when, when, like you're saying, when you tune into one of these and you don't feel like you're getting much out of the company, mm -hmm. I think that says something about the company, but when you tune in and a company is obviously making an effort to share with its investors, right. to make sure its investors understand its business and what's going mm -hmm. on, that's, that is worth more than probably specifically what they're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if there's one that I, that I would suggest, I think it is Two Harbors, we just keep going on and on about them, but they, they really are good about oh, we talking. Oh, we heart Two Harbors. They can, uh, 
they talk about some complex things, but they do a great job of stepping aside and saying, this is what it really means to the business. So I would, I would say that's a good one to listen to. Auto sales, we'll also be seeing auto sales this week on Tuesday. May seem like a strange thing to bring up in a finance show, but there are a lot of banks that are, well, there are obviously a lot of banks that do auto lending, but there are a lot of banks that have been increasingly focusing on auto lending and trying to take some of that market share from the traditional auto lenders. Uh, we'll have the ADP employment change on Wednesday, and then we'll have that small matter on Friday of non-farm payrolls, unemployment, uh, average work week, hourly earnings. I'm gonna be watching farm payrolls. Not, not, I'm <laughs> just, so tired just of, the farms. I'm tired of the non-farm payrolls. Because, because it's the farms that lead the economy. It is, right? we're going back in time. Well, if we don't have food, I guess that's exactly. kind of a bigger deal than anything else. Uh, any, anything in particular, do you have any predictions for the employment situation at the end of the week? No, no predictions. This week, I'm going to be taking the time to, to get ready for earnings. And we're obviously not trading on any earnings, but just to go through, what, what, did, what were the Wells Fargo's of the world, JP Morgan, what were they saying last quarter? And kind of hold them accountable in terms of what are they going to be saying when they present the next week. Or David's so. getting tough. Exactly. All right, moving to our game for today, we've got a round of Grade It. And just as a reminder to our viewers and listeners now, yes, and listeners now, we are on a, we are on a podcast. The the grade it uh, game. We will present uh, three different scenarios, and each of us will be drawing out a picture okay. a, of a representation of that scenario. The first one for you, David. Uh, J P Morgan uh, had its fourth consecutive win on the Keynote Mobile Scorecard. Uh, this is a, a ranking of the mobile apps of the big banks. Wells Fargo was second, while Bank of America and U.S. Bank Corp. were tied for third. Okay. How do you grade that? And while you're doing that, I will start on my wonderful picture. So again, that's uh, J.P. Morgan and its mobile app at the Keynote Mobile Scorecard. I'm I've already got it. I'm ready. You've got it. That is a that is a tiny picture. That is my picture. What it's a we? it's a very tiny tiny thumb. It's a thumbs up but it's very tiny, and the reason is J.P. Morgan's mobile app, is that very important to the investment thesis at J.P. Morgan? No, it's not, but it's better than having a bad mobile app, in my opinion, and their consumer bank, a lot of people think about J.P. Morgan as, oh, it's just the investment bank, they're just trading over there, but the consumer bank, the retail banking at J.P. Morgan is a big deal to this bank. It's a huge franchise, huge deposit base, so the fact that you can keep that and develop the mobile technologies, that's a good thing. What do you say? I say I've got a picture of a smartphone here with dollar signs because that's what mobile banking is today. That's dollar signs and I think it is, I think it's great that JP Morgan is focusing in on that opportunity, that change in the marketplace and is winning accolades for having a usable, functional, mobile application that that, uh, that that customers like to use. It's a customer focused approach. So I am I am in on that one. Okay. The next one, and I will warn you ahead of time, this is a trick question. Let's see if you can if, let's see if you can navigate. Grade it Markel's acquisition of Altera. Might sound funny because that acquisition took place almost a year ago. But go ahead and grade that acquisition. And while you're, while you're doing that, I will start on mine again. This is Markel's acquisition of Altera. And what do you, what do you I got have, there? I have a, an NA, a not applicable, and an A. So obviously, this, is, this was a big acquisition. It, it essentially doubled the size of Markel. This was not a, a small bolt-on acquisition. So the NA is because this is a very long-term acquisition, especially when you're dealing with insurance and underwriting and, and investing the float and the equity there. You can't grade something that's only been integrated the last six months. I mean, they recently integrated the financial statements. So I'm not going to give it a grade on was it a, a successful acquisition as of today. There's no way of knowing. I think this is going to be a good acquisition over the next five, ten years. And the reason I give it an A for the next five, ten years is Markel's management, they've earned my trust that they're going to do right by their shareholders. They've grown book value over the last 20 years by about 15% a year. They're going to earn my trust on that, so they get an A for the long term. Here's mine. This is Mark. This is uh, Tom Gaynor and Mark Hell's management. Little tiny stick figure here with a big giant gold medal okay. around their neck. And no, this isn't. This isn't my drawing of two chains. <laughs> but let me let me tell you why this is a trick question and why this was brought back to the fore. Um, I, I was looking back. This was actually September 19th. 
the Insurance Insider magazine had its had its honors awards, and it announced Markel as the winner of the M and A Transaction of the Year. Mm -hmm. And I'll read a little bit to you from it here. Uh, Markel was the winner of the M&A transaction of the year for the acquisition of Altera Capital Holdings Limited. The judges considered the deal strong economic and strategic rationale that was well received by investors and which has been successfully handled after completion. There are two, two things that I'll highlight there, successfully handled after completion. That's obviously great. Well received by investors, it was not. Mm -hmm. And that's actually why Mar Markel ended up in my personal portfolio because I saw them make this deal. I thought the deal made sense and the stock plummeted. Mm -hmm. But I, this, is, this is just one, one, uh, one feather in, in Markel's cap after doing this acquisition um, and, and I think that they, that they deserve it. So now let's, uh, let's finish off by uh, doing AIG's CEO, Robert Ben Moshe. This was a quote from his last week. Uh, the, he said, the uproar over bonuses was intended to stir public anger, to get everybody out there with their pitchforks and their hangman nooses and all that, sort of like what we did in the Deep South. And I think it was just as bad and just as wrong. David, how do you grade that outburst? It was an outburst. It was, it was not pretty, so I'm giving it a, a face covering the eyes and an unsure smiley face. Yes, I did just draw that <laughs> in less than five seconds. That's very... That, yeah, you are, you are quite it, an artist. When you, when you hear things like that, it, it's never pretty, especially you and I are both investors in AIG. You don't like to hear the, the person that, that's allocating your capital making some, some foot and mouth comments, but that's, that's what it was. It was just a comment that says no long-term implications to AIG as a business. So it's like, covering my eyes right now, but it's fine. What about you? I've got a picture of a sad guy with a dunce cap on. There's not really much else to say for that. That quote speaks for itself. I like Ben Mache. I hate the quote. It was dumb. Moving on to close out on the Twitter sphere. David, give us the first. Speaking of guys that, that you like, we're talking about Warren Buffett here from <laughs> valuewalk.com at valuewalk. What are you trying to say? Buffett fires second Benjamin Moore CEO in two years. Gasp. It's a gas. And the article said... The stock is down on the news, and I like value walk out there, but I don't think Berkshire Hathaway is lower today because of that. Benjamin Moore is microscopic in terms of this conglomerate. Are you concerned by this at all? I'm not. I'm not. Just, it's, it's, it's a bit of news. Uh, Benjamin Moore is a part of the business, but it's not driving it. It's not behind the, the drop today. Let's go to the second tweet. Second tweet is from American Banker. That is at A-M-E-R Banker. Should CFPB be looking at Zillow? How online home price estimators distort the market by at bank things thinks risk doctor. David, this is your this is your company. This is Zillow. They're saying that it distorts the market by making uh, making prices more volatile. The 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 prices that Zillow puts out there are not necessarily accurate. The stats that are based on them, the statistical models they're saying aren't necessarily accurate and consumers are looking at these and anchoring on them. Is this a concern for the company if people lose confidence in those Zestimates? No, I mean, Great they're, answer. They're, talking, <laughs> they're, they're talking about people go on and see, okay, the house is worth this much, that's where I'm gonna start my offer because that's what Zillow says it's worth when the Zestimates can be wrong, if there's an addition, if the county hasn't updated the records, et cetera. I don't see this necessarily as Zillow's problem. I don't think they're giving full, I don't think they're coming out and saying, hey, our Zestimates are 100% accurate. I think it goes on the consumer. You have to be aware that these are just estimates or Zestimates, if you will. They're just Zestimates. <laughs> it's, it's like saying the CFPB should be investigating consumer preferences and consumer behavior. It's, you can't regulate these type of things. People are gonna go online and say, I think my house is worth this much, and I'm not paying attention. To this. I'm, if I'm, I'm a Zillow shareholder. This is not a concern for you for the company. No, I don't. I think the CFPB has a lot bigger fish to fry than Zillow putting out his estimates. All right, close this out here with the last one. All right, going to our last one from Kai Rizdal. He says, boy, I'll tell you what, there's nothing like a morning walk on an early fall day in Manhattan. Matt, you sent me this tweet this morning. I have no idea why you sent it to me. <laughs> Please explain why you're looking at Kyra. First of all, I'm a big fan of Kyra Rizdal. Okay. Second of all, he is absolutely right. And I'll tell you why, it's, it's two times of year. It's in fall and it's in spring. If you were in New York City and outside during a nice day in the fall or a nice day in the spring, you will say, why do I not live here? This is amazing. It is a, it is a dismal city in the winter. It is a 
brutally oppressive city in the summer, but in the fall and spring, oh man, it's, it's amazing. And we were just there last week. It was nice, I'll give you that, until you step in some dog poop, but that's <laughs> Other than that, great place. Fair enough. All right, folks, that is our show for today. Please, please, try not to step in any dog poop if you are in New York, and in the meantime, enjoy the beautiful fall days. Again, I'm Matt Kopenheffer, right here with David Hansen, and we will see you tomorrow.